It's the Craggy Rugby Podcast. It's the midweek edition prior to the Benetton home game, the second attempt at the Benetton home game. Um, it's Tuesday evening. Um, I've got Danny Deegan on the line. How's it going? And uh, William Davis is back with us this week. And you're at the press conference today, William. Yeah, good to be back, Alan. Let's have a listen to first Tom Daly and then Max coach Nigel Carolyn. Tom, how disappointing was it for that game to be called off at such short notice? It must be very disruptive for what you guys were, were planning last weekend. You'd, you'd spend a week getting ready. Yeah, it was obviously very frustrating. Um, we had, had a good win against Zebra, so it was a good buzz about the place. And we wanted to build on that with a bit of momentum going into the Ospreys. But uh, yeah, obviously it was a bit different to the other few. It was cancelled. We only found out maybe we had done our captain's run. It was a couple of... Could have been about four o'clock the day before the game we found out, so it was a big shock. But um, obviously it was cancelled for all the right reasons with them getting a few COVID cases. We obviously, we've worked hard over the last few months to keep COVID out of Connacht and we've been in a tight bubble. So um, yeah, it was obviously very frustrating, but it, it was cancelled for the right reasons. The health and safety of everyone is probably priority at this time. Yeah, just looking on that, is, it, is, is that almost part of the team ethos now we have to keep this thing out and we're every, you know you're pulling each other up you're saying there's a there's rules and regulations we're sticking to them we're going to stop this thing coming into our camp yeah maybe it is yeah we've been we've done so well to keep it out so far so i think um the longer we go keeping it out the more pressure there is not to get it so um i think yeah we've friendly's been saying it like um the team that keeps it out the longest or the team that Stays safe, health and safe, health, healthy and safe. The longest is gonna is gonna go a long way in the competition, and we've done our bit. Obviously, we've been this uh, unlucky with the cancel games, but um, we're getting back on track this week, playing the first one of them cancel games, and hopefully, we'll get a good win. Europe is coming. A lot of players want to play to show how well they're playing because there's there's competition. There's some huge games coming, but you can't neglect this game. Yeah, definitely. I were. Me personally and the team in general, I think we're not looking past uh, Treviso. We know we're in it. We've put ourselves in a good enough position in the league now that if we can get a couple of wins, um, especially this week, if we can get a good, a good win this week, we'll put ourselves second in the league. And that's going to, we don't know what's happening with the league yet. So we don't know when, if we're going to start a new season or if this is going to end after Christmas or what, what the story is with the league. So we just want to make sure we're in the best possible position in that, in that table um, for whatever does happen. Um, but yeah, this game is obviously massive. We were obviously disappointed against Scarlets a couple of weeks ago here. That was a very frustrating loss. And um, we bounced back with a good win against Zebra. But yeah, this game here is massive for us. Um, we know Scarlets lost last weekend, so it'll put us in a good, good, good position if we can get the win. We're not really looking ahead to Europe yet. We'll, we'll get the job done this weekend, hopefully, and then we'll turn the page to Racing the following week. Yeah, and just looking, uh, you played a significant amount of the game against Edinburgh at 10. Is that another opportunity for you? Again, maybe more in a European context that you know you're, you're a player with that second skill, which is the goal kicking, um, to take pressure off another player. Yeah, um, obviously it's something I've done for a long time. Goal kicking, I would have kicked Irish under twenties, nineteens, eighteens, and for my time in Lancer, I would have done a lot of goal kicking. Obviously here, Jack and Fitzy have been going real well, so maybe the opportunity hasn't come to. Base kick, but like I've always been practicing it, and um, I knew I was going to be ready whenever the chance did come, and that came pretty early against Edinburgh, and it went pretty well. So hopefully, Friendy and I and stuff will look at that now and see it as a viable option for me to to goal kick and to cover ten. It's um, I think some people thought that I was just thrown in ten out of nowhere against Edinburgh, and I'd never done it before. But something I practice quite a lot here, and I would have done quite a lot of coming up through the age grade. So uh, I feel pretty comfortable there and confident and. Yeah, like if it means I get more game time and I'm on the pitch more often, I'm happy to happy to play wherever. Tom, you came to prominence through the under twenties and obviously through the sevens, and I'm just wondering, uh, working with uh, with Friendy, who has come, also had sevens background. I mean, do you? I mean, a lot of people would see sevens as being a separate, almost a separate sport from from 15s but I'm just wondering how was your experience with sevens fed into your 15s experience yeah man, my sevens experience was unbelievable to be honest uh, I spent two years with the squad actually captain the squad when I was in the academy in Leinster and I probably wasn't close to getting senior game time in Leinster at that time so um, I think that just gave me an opportunity to play 
high level international rugby at um at a time when I probably would have been playing with my club week in, week out, and maybe the odd Leinster Ray game. So at the time it was unbelievable to get some exposure to top level rugby. But um in terms of sevens and fifteens, I think as a back anyway, it only develops your skills, your one on one tackling, your passing, you're throwing fifteen meter passes every every time. You're defending wide spaces one on one with jinky wingers and centres. So um I don't see how it can't benefit a back and um if you just look at the players who've come through the, the, the seven system, just from my team alone, my two years, I would have played with Alex Wooten, who's here with me now, who's playing really well this year. Adam Byrne in Leinster ha- had two years with us. Dan Goggin, just like numerous other players who've gone on to play senior, provincial and international rugby. Look at Shane Daly last week. He spent a couple of years on Hugo as well. So I just, I can only speak positively of the sevens. Nigel, we're, you're all set to go again, having been cut off at the last possible moment last weekend. Yeah, um, and I guess that's all we can do now, William. It's that be ready to go and uh, and like we'll deal with whatever is thrown at us. Um, it, it's it's a game-by-game game season at this stage. It's hard to look too far ahead. Um, but I suppose at least, you know, from a coach's point of view, the, the work was done a few weeks ago when we scouted them, so we just had to kind of refresh again uh, at the end of last week and uh, a quick look at them over the weekend. Not much has changed, um, but looking forward again to uh, a game this weekend. Yeah, it's a bit of a tough one because there was some players looking, really looking forward to that game. I'm, I'm thinking here, you know, Kim Prendergast was on the bench and you had Conor Sterling coming in at 10 for a start. Just an opportunity to get players in. What are you going to do this week? Do you pick the same team or do you have to make changes with the, the bulk of games coming ahead? and then? players maybe feel they're not getting a chance with Europe on the doorstep? Yeah, it's really tough. Um, it, it's tough to know what's best to do. Um, I suppose we do have one eye on giving some opportunity to players. Um, and, and that's where last week was. We we, we selected uh, maybe through uh, injuries. Well, we, we'd Sean O'Brien Jr. on the bench and, and Colm de Butler on the bench, hopefully to give them some game time and um, uh, but also we've got to look ahead there's the next six or seven weeks are going to be um, pretty intense um, there's no chance to come up for air you're Brassing Bristol the the Interpros and then uh, Bristol and Racing again on the other side of Christmas so um, it, it's a it's a heavy period coming up so uh, yeah we'll look at, we're going to need a full deck to pick from but um yeah, we, we kind of had looked at giving some guys an opportunity last week and uh, again, without it being finalised uh, for this week, but there's um, yeah, there's a few conversations still going on around that. It's quite a daunting prospect. I, I know this game and Connacht are expected to win this game against uh, a side that aren't really firing this season, but there must be real excitement as well. I know it's a funny season. Got two of the biggest teams in European rugby, Three inter pros. It's that must create its own momentum. Yeah, I, I think momentum is an important word because it's the one that we're we're missing at the moment with these games being cancelled. Um, and and I guess our own little inconsistencies as well. I mean, with uh, Cardiff away, Scarlets at home, um, we're just lacking that bit of momentum. And obviously, we would like you know if we had the game go ahead last week and. Um, we certainly would have taken a lot of confidence from how we performed in Zebra. It's, it's not the easiest place to go, but to go over and, and score um, six or seven tries over there, we were very pleased with it. Um, and uh, we were hoping to roll it through uh, last week against uh, the Ospreys and and, uh, and hopefully we get a chance, obviously this week against Benedon, because we just feel, yeah, we'd, obviously with Racing next week and... Um, you need to be at 100% and anything less is going to be punished against them. So it's trying to build up that momentum. What do you actually do when a game's called off that tight? What What do you tell the players to do? Uh, because they're wound up, ready to go. Yeah, it's disappointing for everybody. Um, players, coaches, sponsors, fans, everyone's disappointed. But that's the world we live in at the moment, isn't it? So... Um, Look, friendly got on a call with the lads on on Friday when we found out, and uh, and just said, "Look, at lads, 
we we're prepared for this. We, we know this can happen on a weekly basis, so um, we just can't let it affect us. We got to now be able to park that and and put all our attention onto the next game. And as I said to you, that's why it's one game at a time. It's very hard to look too far ahead because um, it's just so uncertain, and um, it, it, you can't get too far ahead of yourself. You have to be. be be really present and just said make the most out of it today uh, so the players they moved on pretty quick they came in yesterday um, in previous weeks when they were cancelled we ended up going we'll, we'll have a heavy session or something that will simulate something of game intensity um, but the prep was done last week uh, and Friday we'd done our team run so um, look the lads had the weekend off and so look they're fresh they're fresh and, and they're looking forward to this week um against Benetton so uh, the downside where other teams have a maybe a, a week's break this week we didn't have that last week we, we had a full week's prep and then the game gets canned so they just get the weekend off but at the same time we're we're very conscious how fortunate we are to be doing what we're doing and look at that's no secret everyone all, all the teams would be are in the same boat so look at we're happy to be in training you know where there's other people stuck at home so week by week and you've alluded to some of the inconsistencies there. Um, what specifically are you looking to fix in that? Uh, the inconsistencies haven't really been in performance, just been actually taking, um, taking our chances. Uh, I think as a, a coaching group, and particularly someone who's over the attack myself, I, I, I'm looking at our ability to create opportunities. And that's where I feel that you know a lot of the coaching is... is making sure that we manage each of the zones in the pitch and we put ourselves in a position um, that we're creating opportunities. Then at the end of the day, you know, obviously the lads have spoken about that ruthlessness and the cool head to be able to take those chances. Certainly against, I said against Zebra, we had eight chances. We scored seven of them. Uh, against Carlos, I, I think we had, we had five, but we, we butchered three of them over the line. It's very unusual, but uh, it just makes it frustrating. But it's frustrating that we didn't score, but it wasn't in the performance necessarily in that like, we're still creating those chances. So that, look, there's a pleasing part of it. As much as disappointed we are not to get them, we know this, there's nothing broken. Um, the fact that we're, we're still putting ourselves in a position is, we know that it's, uh, we're not far away. It's just, it's just making sure that they all count. And that's what the difference is sometimes between them bonus point wins and, and, and not getting a result. I mean, if we'd taken those three scores the other day, that was a, a bonus point victory, um, you know, and at the end of the day, we didn't and we lost. So, you know, we do talk about fine margins and um, they're costly little errors, for sure. And do you think this group of players are becoming more, I don't say the words happier, but they're more in line with the system you want them to play. There seems to be a very definite, the kicking game now seems a very positive kicking game and it seems to be working. It puts Ebry under a lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, look, uh, I suppose there's a lot of talk about the game, a lot of kicking in the game and negative kicking in the game. And we don't look at it as being negative. Um, like the, the, how we look at the kicking game is, is how it saves fuel. Um, for for our forward pack in particular, and you know, if we have a scrum in our own half, um, the way defences are set up at the moment, the way the breakdown has been reft at the moment, it could take six or seven rooks to break a team down. Um, and to do that, you have got to expend a lot of energy, and to do that in your own half, there's a risk associated with that. And you know, if if it doesn't work out, it's just the life that it gives the other team. Um, to turn over the ball in your own half um, and to give them an opportunity. And again, you, you look at teams, once they get into uh, like that A zone, into the opposition 22, most of the time they'll come away with something. So little turnovers in your own half um, at the moment are, they can be costly. So, I mean, there's nothing more that a pack likes if they were a scrum in your own half and, and, and um, they come out of the scrum and the ball is 50 metres up the pitch and, they then have energy to defend uh, in that half of the pitch uh, and, and force the other team if they want to play out. It seems to be negative, but you know the advantage is with, with the defensive team at the moment and the reward is with the Jackler. So um, there's a risk in playing with that. So it's about managing that risk. It's not saying that you couldn't, but um, it, it's, it's, just, it's just managing the risk, isn't it? 
Quick question, Nigel. I suppose the one thing that the game's been called off is, you, is no matter how hard, how, how hard you try to replicate match day in a training session, the intensity is never going to be exactly the same. It's never going to be 100% match day uh, intensity. I'm just wondering, does that then, is that one of the reasons you've been able to pinpoint as to why can't have been starting matches slowly? Um, is it just that the guys are with these breaks, but to continue on off in game days, that it's it's taking them a little bit longer to get to full match intensity on game day? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about that, Dave, to be honest with you. Um, because sometimes when we train, uh, like obviously um, with, the, with the sports science that's involved in the game at the moment, and when they look at how you train and GPS and all that, like um, some aspects of training or for certain periods in training, they reckon it's about 120% of game intensity. Now, you got to look at the collisions in that. And we, we always, we try and reduce that down to about 80% of match day. But in terms of the speed of what we train at, it's, it's about 120% of, of what a game can be. So to try and keep that level of intensity, I don't think that's the issue uh, or one of the reasons that say we would start slowly. And I, I think sometimes games start slowly. I think sometimes you you got to work your way into a game. I don't think we go out and look to um, you know be the Harlem Globetrotters from the start. I think you got to manage that and and, uh, and and work your way through the various zones to put yourself in a position to score and. Um, yeah, sometimes that takes time, but I don't think it's down to training. But, you know, I do, I do think that, you know, having momentum of games is good for, um, again, just continuity of, of that um, that game experience. I said, that the, you know, training, there is no, you know, comparison between training and the game. The, the players, are, they're players for a reason. They're not trainers. They're players. They want to play the game. So, um you know, and, and that's where they try. That's where we learn the most, you know, is through games. And, and that's where when it stops start, it can halt that a little bit. But, um, yeah, I don't think it's it's a reason for it to be slow. I think the quality of training has been really good and there's there's really good competition in training and, and teams are always mixed up. So um, we never know. We never have kind of a starting team and the others, they're usually kind of, there's a blend of two teams. So it's, they're fairly competitive. There's no such thing this season as a typical kind of try. And I'm just wondering, are you, is that what you, as a coach, you always want to do, to be inventive, to be, to do things that haven't been seen from a kind of team before, not just this season, but in previous matches against, against teams? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, said, I, I think it goes back to the defence at the moment is set up slightly differently where the, you know, the game favours the defence. So to unlock that, I think you've got to look at other ways. Um, of breaking that down and, and for us it is about saving fuel for, for the opposition half at the moment and uh, when we get in there we can start to play a bit of a heavier pattern um, but a lot of our, um, our, our some of our tries or a percentage of our tries are coming from, from attacking kicks or kicking on the front foot uh, and we do a lot of that in training um, obviously when teams are rushing up they're leaving a little bit of space in behind them and we've got good pay but we work hard at it and the players it takes time though to really develop that I think if you you look at Ireland at the weekend they were thinking about it I think that was the seed that was planted on the back of the England game where you know you got a rush defence and think about an attacking kick in behind and then when they played against Georgia that was at the forefront it was like we've got to kick the ball instead of when there's you know there's a bit of space there beside so trying to read all them pictures is the key Um, uh, and it takes time to develop those things, but um, surely, you, you know, you have to think, you know, uh, sometimes outside the box. And um, as I said, with, with actors at the moment, if you play kind of the same way all the time, you're kind of playing into their hands. So you have to break the mold somehow and, you know, look at how your blindside wingers can pop up close to the rooks or use the short side or... Uh, attack back against the grain or use your attacking kick so there's many ways that, there's many tools in the box you can use um, and it's selecting maybe use the, the right one at the right time and, and uh, you know, as I said you try and set the players up in training with all those situations and um, and try and make them comfortable making them decisions and there's, there's no sometimes it's never a wrong decision it's sometimes just the execution of the decision if they see the, the picture that they, they think is there 
Okay, William, and of course we hear we hear Dave in there as well, asking asking his normal. He's getting good at these good questions, following in behind you there, there William. You're setting him up to, to get some good questions in there. But um, yeah, interesting stuff. It's it's as though this this Paris game is sort of hovering over the Benetton game that wasn't expected at this time. Yeah, it's uh, the season's becoming very disrupted for Connacht. Mm. Uh, if you look at the tables, there's there's three teams have managed to play all their games. Um, Ulster. Uh, who played eight and won eight? Zebre, who probably maybe wish they'd had a couple of games off because they played eight, won one, and lost seven. And Cardiff, everybody else has had delays. Connacht are making up a game now. They should be off this week, uh, and that was purposely done so that they could have a week off prior to the start of Europe. Mm-hmm. But they've got to try to get these games played. Uh, I think there are worse teams to play. I think it'd be worse if you were going away, and I think it'd be worse if they were stronger side than Benetton. They're potential banana skin, but they haven't done very much this season. And it's a game, I don't know whether you can use it as a warm-up for Paris, mm. but I think if you look at the side, you've got to remember the Ospreys game was cancelled so late. Yeah. The team have been announced. Mm-hmm. They've done their captain's run, as Tom Daly talked about today. They were ready to go. Uh, certain players were getting a chance uh, who didn't get a chance to play. So it's, uh, Nigel Carroll had said it, it's very difficult. How, how do you pick this team? What are you looking for from uh, the players that you pick? Because they are going in now to a sequence of really difficult games. Uh, they got to get past Benetton, but then they got Racing 92 away, Bristol at home, Ulster at home, Leinster away, Munster at home, Bristol away, and ra- Rassing at home. Now, that is seven of the hardest games that any team... That's like yep. seven test matches in a row. Uh, the three Irish sides will arrive here unbeaten. Mm. They're not going to play any more Pro 14 rugby. So, I suppose they, they don't want to talk about those games, but they're there, and it's how they perform in this game and what they can take out of it. Yeah, because like I suppose the last thing you want to do heading into Europe is 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 have a game you didn't really want, and then you, I don't think you can get much bigger of a difference between what the <laughs> what the U Arena is like compared to a wet and windy sports ground on a cold December evening. There's just no way you can call that preparation. <laughs> no, it's a completely it's a completely different world. I I think that what they'll what they'll have to try to do with with Paris is get excited about it and look on it as a real opportunity. And let's be realistic. They could go there and play really well and still come out with absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's the level that you're going up to. But this has been a disjointed season. Uh, There's further question marks about, is this season going to end? Mm-hmm. Uh, in January, and is it going to restart when the if do the South African teams join? Yeah, when you get David Nusafora, like the performance director, indicating that you know not only do do they expect the pro, the, the the South African teams in there, they need them in there. Um, you know, they, and then Tom Daly said that strange thing there to start, where you know he mentioned the fact that well, would this season end or is it going to be something new in the new year? It's um, <laughs> it really is a strange season. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's unsettling for everybody. Um, you know, Europe is set up very differently. It's four games instead of uh, six. And just talk about moving the Six Nations, because if you push it back by six weeks, you might get really significant crowd numbers in, mm-hmm. and that means significant money. Yep. Um there's a Lions to t- Talking about crowds, sorry sorry to cut across you, but talking about crowds, do we get 200 people in at this game at the weekend because we're back to level three? No, we have to go to level two to have a crowd. Ah. So I'm, af- I'm, a- I'm afraid not, folks. Um, as I've oh. said many times before, some of us will be privileged to be there because we're, we're in working and doing stuff, but there, mm. there, there are, there's no crowds. Yeah, and as you say, like I'm just looking at the table here, and and you're looking at Conference A, and the Dragons have only played five games. Like they're three games back, three game, three teams have played seven, and two teams have played eight. And in our, our in our one, we're the only ones who've played five. But Benetton have only played six. 
Edinburgh seven, Scarlet seven, Munster seven, and and the only ones to play all their games are Cardiff. It's bananas. Yeah, it is. It's 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 very unsettling. There's a, there has to be a huge concern about if games keep getting cancelled. That even if the season rolls on, how you get them played. Mm-hmm. I can only assume in Europe that if a game is cancelled, it's gone. Yeah, I don't see how Europe can can play catch up. Maybe they have a plan. Just hope that uh, both sides, Connacht and Benetton, that they get their tests. Interesting today. I asked Tom Daly this, and I thought it was a very he gave a very good answer. I think it is a matter of professional pride for them that they haven't had a positive test. Yes. They are working very hard on this. That's not to criticise other sides, mm. but I think it's something that is being drilled into the players, the management, everybody around the team. Stick to these regulations. Yes, they're very difficult. Mm. Uh, you, you can't do this. It's a list of things you can't do, followed by a list of things you have to do. Yeah, But they're working hard on it. There's no... As I understand it, no Irish province has had at, at, uh, at, at the top level of the main squad has had a positive test. That's a significant achievement and it's about professional pride. And if it happens, it happens. But mm-hmm. it's something that they're trying to, to, to work with. Connacht has just been unfortunate that the, the games have been called off because the other teams have had issues. Okay, the other thing to come out of the, the press conference today was we got a, an injury update and some of it good, some of it not so good. It's great to see Caelan Blade back. He's come back from his hamstring. That's the good news. Mm-hmm. Um, the bad news is, and the sad news is that Tom Farrell has done an ACL uh, in his knee yeah. and that's a long-term injury. They haven't maybe explained to us how they're going to treat it whether it's surgical or just rest, but I'm afraid that is that's months and months rather than weeks and weeks. And it's, yeah, well, I, I suppose if you look at Ben O'Donnell, is coming back from an ACL that he got in January, and um, I think he's out he's out running with them, but he's still not integrated into the team. And we're in we're in December, and then the other little bit of good news there was was um, Oshin Oshin Dowland's actually training with the team now, so he's he's recovered from his back injury, and we're we're hoping to see him in the in the near future. And as you say, there's so many big games coming up, we might see him sooner rather than later. I think every player that is fit is in contention on a rolling basis now. I mean, we've I've We've just talked up to the end of the European games there. Yeah. But then they could turn around and say, well, actually, now you have to play your makeup game against the Dragons or your makeup game against the Ospreys. They have to be fitted in somewhere unless the whole season. I think Nigel today said it, and I think there is a sense of frustration that they're going game to game. And they always give you the impression that that's the way they're set up. But realistically, yeah. they have to think ahead. Uh, and now it's difficult to think ahead because you're not 100% sure what's going to happen. Which uh, brings in, and, and I think, that, yeah, I think now you said it, you know, you really do have to just play one game at a time. That old cliche is actually for real because there's a real possibility a game can get called off at the last minute. Well, I think the Ospreys game really caught them. Yeah. Uh, it caught us. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it came... Friday afternoon. Once the teams come out, you think yes. we're ready to go here now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I was in the middle. You call you call me because I was in the middle of doing my stats. <laughs> it's like okay, that can stop. Yeah, it's uh, and it's yeah, it's it's just difficult. Um, and Connacht, but, Connacht which, which, and, and, and just just in case people are we are aware, this this is difficult right across the board. This isn't just in sport. It's just sport is sort of highlighting what this COVID thing has done right, you know, to, to everybody in, in practically every walk of life that, you know, but, and I think sport gives you the opportunity to show what this thing has been doing to everybody out there. Like we're not, I don't think we're living in a little little bubble of our own worrying about just that, just sport. I think it's just a reflection on what's happening in society in total. Oh, completely. Uh, And I think it also shows how, I mean, the reason the Ospreys game was called off, one Ospreys player had a positive test. Mm. And he was a close contact of some other Ospreys players. Yeah. And I think the indication there would be that it was possibly a younger player who was living, maybe three of them are living together. Yeah. And they made the decision. You could have said, listen, park those guys, uh, we'll test everybody and we'll go. Mm. They didn't. They just said, no, that game can't be played. So the, the rules and the regulations of this are very strict. Yeah. 
and the way the players are expected to behave is very strict and even getting into the game when we're working at it is very strict it's uh, you know there's there's a there's forms to be filled in you have to do an on day you have to go back and say yes I'm still clear you have to accept that you're in a very restricted area in the ground there's four zones you you get into your zone you stay there mm-hmm. uh, your temperature's taken going in and I think it, there's a trust thing that if you were under par or had a problem you're you really are expected to put up your hand and say look I have an issue I can't go so it's they're doing their best and the hope has got to be that if we can get to the end of this thing and vaccines come on stream and by the middle of the year we can start to come back to some sense of normality everywhere yeah and 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 in sport as well absolutely and and you know we'll just i'll use that link in to to talk to we we you spoke to morgan peak last week we were hoping to bring the to chat about it in the post-match po- uh, podcast at the weekend about what's going on in South Africa and, and the possibility of South Africa joining the Pro 16 and but more importantly what's happened with the Cheetahs who you know we always loved coming up here because they played such a great band of rugby and they had their they had their fans here they had a fan base in in Ireland and they used to come in, and we used to love, love hearing them in the sports ground and um, you had a you had a good chat with them so what we're going to do is we're going to play a couple of clips but you'll be able to get the full interview um, which is well worth listening to on uh, patreon.com slash craggy rugby the fait accompli oh. here seems to be that the big four in South Africa are joining yeah uh, William if I had it also I'd be a really wealthy man at this point in time um, yeah we all know that SA Rugby has decided to boot the cheetahs out of pro rugby um, pro 16 pro 14 whatever they want to call it in future one of the biggest debates going around at the moment is how do we choose the four teams to go and compete up north? And logic tells a person the fair way to do it is to pick the four best teams. And I understand from advertising and sponsors and all that kind of stuff, you know, they want to have a guarantee that the teams will be playing for the next X amount of years. But it is a difficult situation because the cheaters were set to lose their franchise and at the annual or the general council meeting, they decided that the cheaters will maintain their franchise status and they're allowed to go and look for other competitions to compete overseas. Lately, there's been another development where there's talks of the cheaters actually going to go and compete in Russia, and this will give them a, a backdoor entry to compete in other European competitions. There were even talks of a big legal battle that's going to take place with the cheaters. It's absolute chaos at the moment. Going back to, you know, that, that argument of the fair thing to do is to pick the top four sides. Yes, in the Super Rugby unlock competition, there were a couple of games called off due to positive cases. And one of these games was between the Cheetahs and the Lions. And the Cheetahs headed into that match after hammering the Pumas and then beating the Bulls the following week. And the Bulls were, such, were eventually ultimately crowned the Super, super Rugby Unlocked champions. Um, over this past weekend, the Cheetahs got back to winning ways by beating the Greek Wiz, and this actually saw them finish fourth in the standings in the Super Rugby Unlocked competition ahead of the Lions. So um, a very, very strange times in our sport, but the positive thing is that we've got sport. But another question that also pops up is what happens after the Curry Cup ends in January. What happens to the cheetahs? As we mentioned, there's talks that South African teams might be starting in March next year, but I, I, I can't see that happening. I really can't see that happening so soon. I think for the, for the next year, up until 2021, there's going to be no South African teams playing in international competitions. That, that is my personal feeling. This is also what someone... In, in South African rugby mentioned to me and I think it's, it's, pro, it's the safest and the wisest thing to do. I think at this stage we all know there are four teams coming up from South Africa. Mm-hmm. Wayne, we're not sure. The Cheetahs will not be one of them and domestic rugby in South Africa is changing to accommodate that. It's a big, huge, it's a massive change, massive mm. change to what they've had um, And I think there are concerns in South Africa that Super Rugby, Morgan talks about, it might have been wrapped up too quickly. But 
it's all about money, Alan, and it's yep. you know, these decisions have to be made very quickly because you cannot keep hemorrhaging cash, and Super no. Rugby wasn't working. Um, it certainly but, wasn't, and it, it would be fascinating, and it will be fascinating to see those guys if and when they do come up. And and with a bit of luck, maybe we will see the cheaters, and we will get to talk to Morgan a bit more often. Okay, we're coming near the end of the pod, so we're gonna get stuck into our preview of Benetton. And Danny hasn't had much to talk about because he normally gives us some good stats on the previous game, but there wasn't any game for Connor, so he's been pretty quiet up to now. But come on, Dan, what have you got for us for this week? We've got a really good record against Benetton at home. Uh, we've got an 89% win record against them. So we've played eight games and only lost one. Out of the last four home games that we've played Benetton, we've scored bonus point tries in three of them. Okay, we'll definitely need to make that a fourth one. And they've got, you know, we know they haven't won a game and they've been struggling, but their prop, uh, Sheriff Traore, got into the uh, Pro 14 team of the week um, for the weekend just gone by. And... and their hooker, whose name I can't pronounce, but William is obviously going to do because he, you know, he knows these things. Got a hat trick two weeks ago and scored a try again last week. Epilami Fiva is what I've is the best I can come up with on that one. Um, I, I hope that's correct. We'll uh, hopefully by the weekend we might have some assistance on that. Yeah, yeah, with a bit of luck. Normally, again. Normally we'd have someone here, we could chat to them beforehand and find out, you know, are we pronouncing this right? But um, we, we lose all that with, with COVID. But looking forward to seeing a couple of those guys, you know, playing because I think Benetton have been a bit unlucky and um, in some of their games and they've been a bit tighter than, than expected. But yeah, a bonus point would be nice. Well, I think it's a necessity. You know, what is it? What it, what is it? it? When you think about it, Edinburgh lost at home and didn't get a bonus point at the weekend. Cardiff lost at home and didn't get a bonus point at the weekend. So, like, even just a straightforward win for Connacht would put us three points ahead of Scarlets and still have in hand. a game in hand over Scarlets. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's yeah, it's hard, it's hard to it's hard to judge all of this, but I think you need a good performance here. You'll go four and two. They mm. should have eight games played now. Yeah, they've only managed five. five yeah, this is yeah. the sixth game, so it, it's that must be in their heads. They know these makeup games should be played at some stage, mm. um, and I think a good win will go some way to getting them ready uh, for Europe. But I think a lot more of Europe is going to be done on the training grounds and in the video analysis. Okay, so we'll we'll wrap up just before we we hear William give us the, the results of last weekend and the upcoming fixtures for this weekend. Um, we'd just like to thank our our new patrons. We've got a, a number of new patrons who've signed up to us. Thank you so much over the last couple of weeks. It's great. Um, we really appreciate that support. So remember, if you haven't signed up for just the price of a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or even a pint you can support us on the podcast by going to patreon.com slash craggy rugby and, and become a, uh, becoming a patron and another way to help us if you are a patron or even if you're not point us out to other people let other Connick fans know we exist tell them we're there let them you know point them at our craggy rugby.com uh, patreon.com slash craggy rugby we're on twitter at craggy rugby pod hear us on SoundCloud, on Acast, on, we're on Spotify. Ask Alexa, ask Siri, just play us. We're there. Here's William. Sunday the 29th of November. Benetton 19, Dragons 26, Cardiff Blues 10, Glasgow Warriors 19. On Monday the 30th of November, Edinburgh 14, Ulster 43, Munster 52, Zebra 3. But in the Pro 14 on Friday, December the 4th, Connacht versus Benetton with a 7.35 p.m. kickoff. And on Saturday the 5th of December, the Glasgow Warriors take on the Dragons with a 7.15 p.m. kickoff. Loose, cut it loose. Break out or nothing changes. Sad and confused. Don't wait until 